Okay. Well, welcome and thank you so much for uh, taking my invitation. I know you're a busy guy, a father and an athlete and, and a businessman and lots of stuff now. Uh, but I have to ask you a question uh, because you and I are both living in Norway and we're not Norwegian. So we have that in common. Um, and my pathway was kind of strange met a Norwegian woman in the United States at a sports medicine Congress, but she was Norwegian, which meant that if I married her, the rules said that I could also live in Norway, but I haven't figured out how you get to live in Norway because you're, you're Catalan and your partner is Swedish. So how did you do that? Yeah. Well, first, uh, thanks for uh, having me here. It's a, uh, it's a pleasure. It's a, uh, it's a big honor for me. And yeah, actually, you know, I think it's this thing in, in Scandinavia that is like, okay, it's Sweden, Norway, and like uh, Denmark, but they kind of go along each other. So they even like, um, I think for Swedes, for example, to go live in Norway, they don't need to to have anything like uh, the D number for Sweden was here. So it's kind of, a, yeah, uh, they have this, uh, this agreement between all the Scandinavian countries and okay. actually... <laughs> Emily, my my wife, she was studying um she did the university in Tromsø, so in Norway. So she was uh she had already like the D number here in Norway. So yeah, it's uh, okay. and for us it was like Norway has mountains, so it's it's no way we go to, to Sweden. So we we love when it's steep and here is the place. Okay. All right. Well then I get that. And 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 you grew up in the mountains and and Everybody that knows about you knows your story that already, I guess at six years old, you had done 4,000 meter peaks or something like that. So, so you have called yourself a lover of mountains and yeah, Norway has mountains, but you're living at what, 19 meters above sea level or something like that. Uh, so it's not, you're not really living in the mountains, are you? Yeah. Well, like it's, that, that's funny that, uh, I was born like in the, in the Pyrenees or so like high altitude, 2000 meters. I was uh, doing the university at Font Romeo, that is like at uh, 1800 meters. And then when I moved to the Alps, I moved to, to Chamonix area, and that's like 1000 meters of elevation. The mountains are like 4,000, but the, the villages is like 1000. And I was so scared about like, will I lose everything, like all my my capacities, because I'm going right. to live at so low altitude, like only at 1000 meters. And, uh, and and now here I am like at uh, sea level living, but it's it's funny that uh, because that's a common thing here in Nor Norway that they are very scared about like going to race uh, in the Alps or in high in high altitude like you know with the cross country skiers and they are like oh how we should we go in advance to to train in altitude and or should we stay here and just sleep low and then just go for the race like races that they are at one thousand meters and like. Uh, for me, even now, like I've been living here for six years and I, I never like up to 4,000 meters. I don't feel kind of any difference. Like I could go tomorrow, go to Mont Blanc and, and it will feel good. So I don't know if it's that my pathway to, to acclimatize up to where I'm more used that I would say it's around 4,000 meters. It's, uh, it's there and I don't need to free or like acclimatized to go to this altitude because yeah it's i was worried about that and but yeah don't feel anything to go to raise at three thousand meters or four thousand right well and this is really an interesting topic because uh, i guess part of the background for our discussion is you've you've written a, a wonderful um rel pretty detailed description of your season this year the training that you did to achieve a fairly tough uh kind of quadruple where you had a sh what you call a short race which is about <laughs> marathon distance and then a very long ultra which is over 20 it was over 20 hours and then another short race and then another long one and so this was a different what people would call a, a periodization challenge you know how do you how do you program all this but it, and you've written a really nice uh piece on all this and showed your data you're one of the athletes that that shows your data through Coros. You know, you've showed the heart rate data. You've showed this data. So we really appreciate that because I think that's one of the ways we learn a lot about endurance training. And you now, this is one of the things that struck me was this issue of kind of what you brought with you his, just from years of training. 
that you kind of feel like is just in your body versus of course the fresh fruit that is your your form at the time and most mm -hmm. people would say that altitude yeah you got to you got to go to altitude you got to do your your camp and you get your hemoglobin push and so forth and so you you know you don't seem to feel like that's an issue for you at all um do you know for example your hemoglobin it's very low actually so um okay uh, but uh, actually it's uh, funny that i think i i need to acclimatize if i go to himalayas like to yeah. six seven thousand meters there of course but i think it's um uh it was interesting this year that one of the races was hard rock that is in colorado and it's like it, it the the average altitude is 3,000 meters, or the lowest altitude is 3,000 meters, the highest is 4,000. And I traveled from Norway like two days before the race. And um, and it was okay. Uh, and, and I was wondering, yeah, okay, that's uh, what are the, the climatization like stimuli? And uh, I, I did just like uh, one night before traveling to the US, like uh, uh, altitude. Um, so that's not enough for like creating adaptations that we know that uh, it's but i think it was just like probably to be i have been a lot in altitude in the past years and then um on on these kind of acclimatization mechanisms the body knows better how to climatize now than probably the first time i was going there so maybe just giving the stimuli of like okay it's altitude something coming it started to to create the, the adaptations and then in, in, in altitude, like I have been to expedition sometimes, go to 8,000 meters, spend like a month at 6,000 meters, the lowest altitude, come back home. And I have my um, hemoglobin like 14 and my hematocrit like at uh, 47. It's like, come on, like I spent like one month there, like should be like 50 <laughs> or like 16 in, in hemoglobin. But um, actually uh, I was um, talking with some physiologists and reading some studies that it's different, like, how, for example, the Nepali people adapt to altitude is, is not really about like hemoglobin, but it's more about like the all the ventilatory systems and the capillarization and all that, yeah. uh, uh, opposed to um, what the, the, the Quechua's and so the America, that there is like a, a big adaptation on hemoglobin and all that. Yeah. So maybe my adaptation to altitude, it's, it's more on a ventilatory way. Right. right, and right. Then, then probably the climatization or like the adaptation to that, it can be quicker. Uh, than than through hemoglobin, but it was yeah I I, yeah. I I don't know the reason, but it's yeah it's yeah. So surprising. so you're not a world champion sky runner and schemo athlete because of your hemoglobin percentage. We can say that not that's, at all. Yeah, that's not the secret weapon. Uh, but what I do see when you're writing about these things, and also your approach to racing, your approach you even wrote about getting sick and and being able to still race is. And maybe this is part of the answer is that you're you're racing generally at sub maximal levels so you're not doing these races like the cross-country skiers where they're basically at vo2 max every climb and you are finding your level you're able to make adjustments on the day where you need to be and in the race on the, you know and, and manage your body it seems to be that is the gift or the the what you, one of the things that you do really well is manage your body during races and find find your level, find your intensity, and make changes where, where needed to to make this happen. So I, I that's what I experienced when I was reading what you were writing about, and maybe that's that's your secret to altitude as well is just just accepting and finding and not getting scared by the the ventilatory response you may feel does that make sense yeah it does make sense that uh, i think that's that comes with knowledge and and more you are used to to a situation uh yeah probably like uh, physically you will adapt better because you have responses from that on the past but also like uh, mentally you, you know what's going on so like you can adjust more and, and i think that comes to tactics like uh, if you see someone like going faster uh, and say, okay, I, I know what's going on. I know my capacities. I know what will happen if I try to follow and, and try to, to to know yourself, to know what are the capacities and, and see how how much you can push, how much you can go. And I think that's um, that's something that it comes with experience and and it's, it's not really a way to train it, I would say. It's just you need to, mm. to do it. And that's like to just 
if you race a lot and, and you try of to analyze what's going on on the races to to do better in the future but also i think like um on on mountaineering that's uh something that can you need to learn a lot how to adapt to the situations because uh and there is more the the management with uh, risk also like uh, if you are climbing a a big phase and and then it's like uh some problems like it can be a uh, avalanche or it can be like rock falling or like that you are in a technical place and and uh, and if you fall you die and then how how you overcome this fear and and how you uh, how you analyze this fear and say okay that's something that it's telling me that i should just go down go home because i'm not prepared or it's just part of my mental limit on this situation and how you deal with that i think it's uh it's with putting yourself to these kind of situations gradually. Mm. And then you arrive at a moment that you don't master it, but you are much more sensitive to when taking decisions. And in racing, it's kind of the same in another scale that it's mm. knowing your capacities and knowing how you can play with uh, play with them. Mm. Well, it's it's fascinating. I, I'm thinking back at one time you you put out a, a a little video on Twitter where you were running right on the just the ragged edge of a, a peak where either way you misstep and you fall down. And I was just like, oh, oh my gosh! I was getting I was getting a you know heart rate was going up just looking at it. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I had to make a silly Twitter video of myself running <laughs> on a, a a one meter high thing, you know. Anyway, so yeah, for most of us, our, we would just not be able to deal with the anxiety, the fear associated with the technical aspects of some of the things you do and the consequences of, of error, uh, which, you know, they are big in some of the runs that you do. Um, but one of the things, you know, you've gotten older, you, you're, you've established a family, you've moved to Norway, you have two children. And you have a partner that is still an athlete. So you two have, have a negotiation. You, like, you both need to train every day. And these two children need what they need. And so you have created this split day program where between the two of you, you have a two slots. You have a, what was it? 8.30 morning, to 12. Morning, morning and afternoon. Is 8.30 to 12 and 12 to 3 or something like that. You know, yeah. and you each one is going to take, but but those are the slots. And that means... That now for most of us, we'd say, oh, well, three hours, that's plenty of time to train, but we're not ultra runners and we're not preparing for events that may last 20 hours. So you have adopted these, uh, a higher frequency of training, but shorter runs, shorter sessions in total. Uh, and again, you fall back on this experience issue that you know how to do 20 hour runs. You somehow it's in your body and in your mind and you can get away with this and do only four hour runs and still be ready. Um, how are, how yeah, you that happen? <laughs> well, no, no, because like, I, I think the big problem when you analyze training is often you see, okay, what have you done for the last, uh, three months or six months or like last year yeah. it's like okay that that's that says nothing like uh that's just like a very acute responses to training that will not change it will like it, it can make you a bit more specific to something but here is not where you win races like uh i would say like what uh, these this winter for example like i was in the ski season and i was going to do a hundred mile race um without any yeah. running training and 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 it was uh, it was okay and and that was i think because first uh i i have um my, my metabolism is is it's like almost pure fat metabolism okay. so uh so that means that i in general i adapt very well to to long distance like i i can go for and that's because i have always been running and doing training without food without Mm, drinking for 10 15 hours and, and it's never been a problem uh since uh, i don't know since i was i remember when i was 12 13 years old doing like six seven hours without any food so that's something that um that it don't scares me to to go out for long and and, and my body risk like the, the body response is okay it, it, it handles it so i think that's um that's a one point and then the other is like 
in hundred miles, like it's a lot about like managing the energy. Like you can know, uh, yeah, it's the engine is one thing, but then like how you are able to to manage the muscle pain and the and the and the energy, it's what will make the difference. So like that for the experience, I know that I can um, I can do a good uh, strategy on that. So then it was like okay, I just need to to do the kilometers every week for the muscles. Mm. And I know that uh, my metabolism, I, I I don't need to train that because it's been like for 15 years right. I have been training that. So to train a specific this year, it will not make any change. Yeah, and it's interesting what you wrote. It could be, I, I, in this era where we're constantly training with various gels and and carbo drinks and everything that every training we a, a lot of athletes even uh, recreational athletes feel like that they need to supplement or use drinks and gels even in one hour training sessions and and i think you know i i feel like this is problematic but you really mm -hmm. show this because you say you you basically never train with food you, you don't take food on board during normal training or or fluid is that correct yeah, mostly like fluid is most of logistics, kind of like it's yeah. it's hard to get water like when you are up in the mountain. So I say, okay, I uh, I think I have a a good liver. Well, but like but that. you uh, could be wearing a vest full of these yeah, little little gel uh, yeah. uh, bottles and everything, but you just don't do all that. Yeah, it, it feels like, yeah, no, I, I don't like it. I think like, uh, and, and then like the, the body responds well. So then I it's like, okay, I don't need it. But um, But yeah, I think like, First, like if we are used, I think it's important to to have like a good um to be able to take a lot of uh, of carbs for a race. It's important. Right. You need to be to be adapt for that. But if you train only uh, this uh, with this substrate, if you only train with uh, um, high carbs, uh, then all your other metabolisms like you will not train them. Like uh, you will have very good uh, glycogen uh, metabolism, but like the, the metabolic flexibility that uh, I still believe that even for races that they are pure glycogen, it's important to have a, a, a good uh, metabolic flexibility. Right. And and I think that's like um, to, to be able to train um, uh, with uh, uh, yeah fasting or to be able to, to perform with... Uh, with uh, uh, yeah, not only uh, carbs. I think it's important, and especially like if you are able to to. We know that it's not that you are using only carbs or only fats. So if you are able to to have a bigger switching, uh, probably like I think for health, but also for um for the for the performance, it's uh, it's better. And and we yeah think or or I feel that for me it's important to get used to to do both like to to train like uh yeah uh mostly on on, on a fat metabolism or on a an agriculture metabolism and, and that's why I, I do most of my trainings on on uh yeah without food and especially all the the volume season like the the aerobic season uh to to do like that and then just like some specific days uh, before the race to to get used to do it like 90 or 100 uh grams of carbs per hour yeah so you were able to get up and ramp up to that high carb intake for races without a lot of gut training or we might call it uh and, and a lot of athletes really struggle with that um i, I remember speaking with um uh, tim de Clark. he's a cyclist mm -hmm. and his races might go to six hours and he said even in the last couple of hours of those races he might find that he's starting to have trouble taking it's hard enough enough carbs. it's hard to take a lot yeah yeah for, so, especially for like you have them be to throw sometimes or things but you need to yeah you, you need to train it yeah. but also i think it's um yeah it, it's uh, also i think experience because you can start to feel okay now it starts to feel a bit too much so change or like decrease for 30 minutes the amount or for one hour but yeah it's it's not easy to eat a lot of of carbs and yeah yeah well you know in this the old, the endurance spectrum that I work within as a physiologist ranges from four minutes to, well, speaking to you, 20 hours plus. That's a huge range. And we can kind of break that down into different segments. Maybe up to 15 minutes would be that 
you know, essentially VO2 max where you're going to be mm -hmm. at, at max heart rate or whatever when you cross the finish line. And then we get into that range, maybe up to somewhere around a half marathon distance. That's that, you know, like lac maximum lactate steady state kind of situation, a time mm -hmm. trial. And, and hopefully you've got enough glycogen to get you to the finish line at a very high burn rate and, and somewhere between half marathon and marathon that it runs dry. And then you you represent what goes beyond the marathon and, and all of the body maintenance issues when you're, you're, you're absolutely not going to be able to finish the race without maintaining the body, without drinking and eating. So you've got these, the spectrum is pretty, mm -hmm. uh, is pretty big and you have probably at least part of your, you, you've had races in the shorter end of the spectrum. Uh, did you ever, when did you know that you said, well, I'm, I'm not a 10 K runner. I'm not a five K runner. At least that's not going to be my best distance. When did you understand and how did you figure that out? Um, well, like flat, I had never run like a, like, uh, track or that, but like, I started with skiing. So, so running like I started to run like much later for like as a training for skiing, but actually um, I, I I like to to do um, in in ski mountaineering for example that the race is a sprint that is a three minute race, and then we have like uh, from relay that it's like a ten minute or like vertical race twenty minute. Like I know that I'm I'm very bad at uh, under a uh, uh, three minute kind of uh, this kind of a speed. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not. Um, I'm not good at all. Like I, I don't have, uh, I think, uh, um, fast, uh, uh, like, uh, um, muscle fibers mm -hmm. can. Okay. So it's, uh, yeah. it's, uh, I cannot, I cannot sprint. Like, uh, I, I, I will do like a hundred meter sprint at the same speed. I will do a 400. <laughs> it's for, for me, it's impossible to, to go faster on that. So, so I'm, but when it comes like higher than like, uh, like the races that we do or like, today we did a race it was like uh, uh 20 minutes there is like beauty max it's uh when is beauty max work like there i i think that is where i can like really perform well yeah. and i think uh then it's uh from beauty max kind of effort to to ultra running i think it's it's uh kind of similar it only changed how you manage the, the effort yeah. because then yeah. Uh, when it's like a kind of one hour effort, uh, then, then it's more playing on, on knowing what's your, like, what should be your pace here. Like, so, so of course, if you have a higher B2 max, like pace, and, and if you have the, the muscle capacities or the muscle training to, to handle it for like longer to one hour event kind of that, you, you will perform well. And same goes with, uh, with, um, up to like uh, two hours or like kind of marathon distance then starts to be with more also like the metabolical way so uh that you need to to have um uh yeah being better on substrate than right than beauty max and then for there to ultra running i think it's mostly like management like it doesn't matter the capacities it's just like how able you are to manage uh muscle breakdown uh fueling like all the energy systems and then just like mentally pain and 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 discomfort so i think like uh for for all the other yeah i think on on roads is different because it's a lot of the running economy it makes a big difference mm -hmm. but on mountains uh i would say bo2 max i think like in cross country or that that it's still very important um mm -hmm. for going up uh, and your so vo2 max is is high uh, in, uh, I don't, am I... Yeah, I, I have like 92, but you know, bit max is it depends a lot how you test, when yeah, you yeah. test. So it, but uh, yeah. But I mean, yeah, when it's that high, whether it's a little bit, you know, if it's really only 88 or it's really 92, I mean, any way you put it, that's a very high aerobic capacity. Uh, you know, that's that's for most humans, that's off the charts. So you you do have the tools. You've got the big engine relative to your body size and then you probably have an extremely high uh slow twitch fiber composition yeah. 
so that excludes you from sprinting. You were never going to be a great sprinter, but it <laughs> puts you right at where you wanted to be to, to do what exactly what you do. Um, but then there's this, uh, another aspect of what you do, which is the technical side of it. And, and you talk about in the training now where you're living that you don't have high mountains to train in. You know, there's some of the things that perhaps you would like to have in the trails and that are, are not there, as I understand. But you, is, if I understand correctly, you use the technical trails for low intensity runs and then you mentally focus on technique and then you do your quality sessions or your key workouts more on dirt roads or paved roads. Is that how you're handling the workouts? Um, yeah, especially like here in Norway, trails are very technical because it's not like big trails like in the Alps or that, that it can be like trails that work where you can run very easily. Here, it, it's often like either you run on roads or you run on like something that where you need to really look where you put the feet. Right. I, I so, call them I call them goat trails. That's Yeah, that's exactly. Good. It's a goat trail. So it's it's goat trails around. So it's very good for working the technical capacities but but not to work the speed. So then like um what um what I do is normally when I go for like easy days like aerobic, then I I try to to train these other aspects like the the technical aspects the the mental aspects uh, i can work more on 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 this uh uh, uh yeah m- more the 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 year or like so focusing on other things because m- many times like you say okay it's a easy run but what means easy like it's it's not you, when you train we often focus only on metabolism but it's many other things like uh, we can train on on the yeah on the substrate we were saying before, like how you train your gut, or we can train on the technical capacities, or we can train on 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 the oxygen, or we can train on on so many things. So right. the easy runs might be not a key workout when it comes to to metabolism, but it can be a key workout for for other other capacities. And especially mountain running is like every race is different. Like you cannot um train for a specific race or you can train but then it's like living at that place and training all the time at there but every race will have a very different weather very different um conditions very different elevations inclinations so it's very hard to recreate uh every race um but what you can do is to to create the the capacities that you need for every race like uh, uh when it comes to to uh, metabolism to lactate to 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 the muscles and then like technically having a, a big adaptation so being able to 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 run on very different terrains and that like it's many many people that ask like i live in paris or i live in oslo wherever and i want to train for technical mountains what exercises can i do can i do something in the gym can i do? it's like no, like you need to go to live in the mountains and train in the mountains and do different things every day. It's because it's more related to the, um, like the the visual and, and and muscle connection, like and the neuromuscular connections, than than physically. It's it's how you are able to to um yeah to anticipate the movements and to be able to to put the feet where you want without needing to to look there. And, and and I work with all the peripheral vision. So that's something that you cannot really train um, if it's not doing, you can train doing more, maybe mountain bike or other speed sports, but uh, it's something that you need to train on the terrain. And easy days are good for that, that you can use technical terrain. So your, your, your feed, your uh, vision, uh, all, all the, all that it's, uh, it's working. Right. And I, and I think that that way of thinking is really important because you you a lot of people that I listen to the uh, recreational athletes, they use this term trash miles, um, meaning that if it's not a hard if it's not a key workout, then it's just kind of filling up the volume and they don't understand that that's just not true. Number one, they're all you know, the metabolic aspects are important. But number two, every session you, you know, as you say, you have intention, you're working on some aspect of your 
body, whether it's your breathing or the technical foot placement or drinking, every session has value and intention. And I think that's what good athletes understand that, that maybe some of us who are age groupers and that we, we think it's only the high intensity sessions that really are important. Uh, so I, I, it's a really important lesson, I think, for athletes. And it's not just for trail run, or, you know, the, the ultra athletes, it, it's rowers and skiers. And, you know, there's always something to work on, even on an easy day. Uh, and that's a really important take home message, I think. Um, no, and, and especially, I think, easy. Yeah, like if we do um, endurance sports, like uh, all the sports like you were mentioning, they are uh, endurance sports. So like we need to work the, uh, I believe that we need to work the aerobic capacities, first of all, like, uh, because if you are working only intensity, if you are only working VO2 max, if you are only working a uh, lactate threshold, you will create like adaptations in the very short time. Yeah. You will be able to, to, to run fast, but you will not be able to create like, very long-term adaptations and 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 i think uh yeah to toward the aerobic uh, capacity it's it's a lot of easy days uh like a lot of hours at easy pace and and that don't means that you are not training hard like of course you need to do the the the, the intensity training but also like uh, that uh, that demands a lot and, and personally like i i feel myself that if i do a lot of intensity um i i get either in shape too early, either uh, injured after a while, um, or overtrained. So um, I, I know that if I do more than two intensity days a week, three maximum for uh, more than six, seven weeks, it will be negative. So I prefer to do a, like a long, long, like, five, six, seven months of only like uh, zone one and two. So very like uh, easy, mm. uh, mostly two, uh, I would say. But uh, and then like uh, when the even w when the races are like or when the the specific session uh, season is never do more than for me, like uh, two, three hard sessions a week, because I know that if not, it, it I will not improve. Uh, I, mm. I know that. Uh, I don't need more to improve. It's not that if I do more like BO2 max sessions, I will improve my BO2 max. It's uh, because uh, for what are my, uh, like individually, my metabolism is very different than yours and very different than another person, very different than another. And it's not better or worse. It's just different. We need to, to, to say, okay, my metabolism, maybe it works very well on that path. So like, let's train on that, not on that, that it works for another and that I think it's hard when you see um, when you see other people training faster and doing more sessions, uh, more like speed sessions that you think, okay, if I do like them, like if I do more speed, I will improve. But uh, maybe you don't need to. It's not that uh, it feels that that it says that the, the people that do more that are able to do more speed during like more sessions of speed will progress more, uh, but maybe that's not true it might be that people need less speed or some people need less speed to progress more and uh, and i think that's something that uh, especially today with like all the social media around like a uh, training it's hard to 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 understand okay maybe i need less speed training to to improve my bo2 max or like uh, i need to work my uh, more my aerobic capacity and uh, as a as a fun example like now i i've been like four weeks of season, like after uh, with Team B that it was like four weeks ago, uh, I've been like, just like taking my bike to the school with the girls and like uh, going for like nice climbing days, but not any kind of uh, real training. And today I did a race that it was like a 20 minute uphill, like 40 degrees um, um, of incline. And so that's a pure kind of uh, BO2 max mm -hmm. race, like uh, 20 minutes. And I did like 16 seconds uh, mm, longer than my personal best right. on a trail that I go there. And it's like, I have been doing nothing, like only like yeah. very like easy, like a zone one, uh, like a training and for four weeks. And now I'm able to like do a, a beauty max, like pure race and do like a 
kind of uh, of my best level. A very so high level, yeah. That means like, yeah, the adaptation is not from these sessions, but probably is from the past. And then like, if he, so it's, uh, yeah, it wonders like how, yeah, it makes me think like how much important is this kind of shapering towards like long-term right. adaptations? Well, and it's an interesting issue, but the, and if we really look at the, the research on interval training that, you know, these high intensity workouts there, if you're already doing the volume, then they only give you a, a few percent increase. You know, mm-hmm. if you're doing nothing from before, like untrained people, and then you do interval training, well, then they get a pretty big effect because they're not doing anything. And that's unfortunately what has helped drive the interest in interval training. Yeah. Because, you know, if you're sitting on the sofa, then these high intensity sessions give you a quick effect. Mm-hmm. But you're not sitting on the sofa. You, you know, you're you're doing the work day in and day out. And, and, and most of the VO2 max effect is already achieved with your volume, right? And we've seen this in, in the elite athletes is that when they increase their volume, their VO2 max goes up you know, without an increase in, in, in intensity. So this is one of the things that I think it has been useful to learn by studying the best athletes. And then we see that, well, it's, it's not interval training alone that increases your VO2 max. It's the total, you know, just doing more work. And you, you show that because you can, you know, in four weeks, just by doing the volume you do in what you would call a recovery period, you're still getting a lot of stimuli. Um, so, so I think this is important that, um, I guess that's one of the take home messages that I see from all of the best athletes like yourself in the endurance game is that you understand the value of duration, the value of the, the extensive work and not just the intensive work. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it makes sense. And, and it's important to do intensive work. Like uh, we know yeah. that it has a lot of uh, benefits, but also like over the period, like it's um to do, I, I also like believe that one key session, it gives you nothing. Like it's just like the body will be just like, oh, what's going on here? And oh, okay, <laughs> let's go to normal. If you want that it have an effect, it's like you need to do it like, at least like, I don't know, uh, 20, 30, 40 times. So yeah, that means like uh, at least one year of doing intensity sessions. Like, so it's like, then the body will say, okay, that's something normal. So I need to, to, to adapt to, to right. this, uh, that's going on. So like, it's, um, yeah, I, I think it's, um, many times like we focus uh, and especially like uh, on science, we focus a lot on what's the, the specifics of like, uh, okay, we are doing like, a. Uh, two minutes, uh, um, 10 repetitions of two minutes with right. recovery 40 seconds. Uh, uh, in my world, but I personally believe like it doesn't matter if you do two minutes, one minute or like, uh, or yeah, maybe one to two minutes is the difference, but like two minutes or or, or two and a half and then like 40 right. seconds or recover 30 seconds and 20 yeah. repetitions or 10. Like if you are, I think it's more important if you are able to do that every week for like three years, it will give much better adaptations right. that if you do like something very specific, but you are not able to to do it through the time. And and it's uh, yeah, it's the repetition that gives the adaptations. It's not the 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 stimuli itself, but it's the repetition of the stimuli. Yeah. Well, you, you know, it's it. I, people like me that aren't very good at sports, you know, we say that we have doctors yeah, yeah. and PhDs and you know and all this stuff, and people say ah. He doesn't know what he's talking about, but when you say it, it, it makes a difference. So I appreciate that, you know, because it, that's what I see myself from the data, uh, but it really helps to have the best athletes be able to, to tell the rest of us, Hey, you know, it's not the Epic workouts that uh, lead to great performances. It's the consistency. It's like you say, accumulating tens uh, and twenties and thirties of these really good workouts in the course of a season uh, that, that give results. And, uh, so, so it, as many times as you say it, it, it doesn't, it seems to be necessary to say it, um, again. Um, mm-hmm. I just want to make sure I, cause I, I walked through your work and I, I took mm-hmm. some notes and so I want to make sure I'm getting through. Um, one of the aspects you talked about was 
was recovery. And you described yourself as an, an introvert, and, and I am an introvert myself. I, we're what we function in society. We can we can be among people, but you 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 recharge your batteries under conditions where you're not around a lot of people. And I totally relate to that. And you've moved to a place where you can kind of create an environment that that is um, appropriate for training for you. And, and one of the things I found interesting was that you, you talked about, the, you, you kind of have a, in Norwegian, they call it court race, a short travel, yeah. a, a short travel training philosophy that you're not doing a bunch of altitude camps. You're not doing a bunch of you know, any kind of, camp, you, you create conditions at home for effective training. Is, and, and, and it's, you know, because travel days are stressors, like you said, you, you know, you sh they're not rest days, they're stress days and so forth. So that's an interesting, it'd be interesting to just hear your thoughts on, uh, <laughs> on how you have kind of organized your life to reduce the outside stress and get the most out of your training. Yeah, I, I, I really, I have been traveling a lot and racing a lot. I had done some, some seasons where I was doing like a, uh, uh, 50 races between skiing and, and running and that's uh it's it's uh, good i think when you are young because you learn a lot on racing like you need to race a lot to to learn uh a lot but um on another way you are not training well like you are just like traveling doing a a big effort and then just racing and then doing a big effort and and if you want to train uh better i think is you need to have an, an environment that it's uh it's good for it so like you feel first like uh is is the the minimum amount of stressors and that uh, it, it might depend a lot uh, as you mentioned personality like if you are an introvert probably like you don't want to live in a place where you have a lot of social interactions and and that uh, uh you have like a lot of uh, big um like meeting a lot of different people for training or like uh, uh and, and if you travel if you go to training camps that happens uh if you are home probably you are trained alone or with uh, uh, some friends, with a group of people that you know. So it's not an a stressor. Um, and then like creating the, these uh, conditions, like to to say, okay, what do I need for, for training? What do I need? I need uh, altitude, I need uh, snow, I need uh, these uh, terrain conditions. Uh, uh, it can be uh, a track or it can be like uh, just uh, trails or so try to see what do I have around my place? Uh, how can I, should I move somewhere else or, or how can I create it on my place, uh, finding these places and to create this, this environment. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's the most important for recovery. It's, it's, it's not about like tools, but it's about the environment that you, you are surrounding yourself and then traveling. Like it's, uh, uh we were talking about, about, uh, before about consistency and you, you need to be consistent in your training. That means that, if you are traveling for a training camp, uh, you will probably lose like two, three days of training because the travel, because the, the adaptation to this new area to find the good places to train and, and all that, uh, plus the risk of like getting sick about uh, all these, these problems. So if you are able to do it home, why you need to go to travel somewhere else? And then you need to analyze, for example, altitude. Uh, I know that it's a rising altitude. It's uh, enough like uh, what will be the difference between training in altitude or not training in altitude? It's it's enough a motive to go train in altitude. What will be the final benefit of uh, spending like three weeks in uh, uh, two thousand meters in in Sierra Nevada or in Fort Romeo or or in Colorado? That benefit uh, it will be more than just stay home and do uh, more consistent training. Then you need to analyze and, and and many times we don't ask ourselves like okay I. Uh, I, I just go because it's it's in the loop and it's it's what we do. But maybe even if the benefit of altitude training will be there, maybe that's uh, the the what you lose from all these. It will be more than than the benefit. So to really analyze that and see can can I do it another way? Uh, especially that knowing then it's like going to the 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 individuality and that comes to as I mentioned altitude. In my case, I I know that maybe my altitude adaptations. Are not through through the um, the 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 hip one and and the and the and the hemoglobin, 
So if it's more adaptations on a ventilator way, maybe I can do something home with other stimuli that they are activating that. Uh, if it's hemoglobin, uh, maybe you can do some training on heat or like some things. So I think it's always to put what are the benefits, what are the the what I will lose doing this training camp, uh, and and see yeah and see if if it really gives an advantage or not. And and I believe that most of the times it will not give an advantage. Right. Well, and it seems that you. In, in keeping with other athletes, Niels von der Poel kind of, he, he talked about some of the same things that the speed skater about, he just kind of created a, uh, he, he negotiated for himself a situation that he could handle that reduced external stressors so that the, the stress was training, yeah. but the, but the others, he, he reduced all the externals and you've done a lot of the same is that, you know, yes, you, you have a family and you have all these issues, but you've done the best you can to make it a, the training is a lifestyle. It fits in, uh, and your partner, you, you know, you have your, you've negotiated and it works. And so that part of the stress is low. And then the training stress can be fairly high. And I, I think that's, you know, one of the big differences between you and uh, professional athletes that manage that. And then the rest of us is we've got other we're just not very good we have lots of other stress sources you know we, we're being stressed yeah. by all kinds of stuff and then we think we're gonna train hard at the same time and and we tend to the bucket just gets too full of stress uh, in total because we don't we don't manage we're not able to manage that very well we don't make those good decisions uh, or, or or we cannot so so that's a lesson i think now i want to get at two more things before i let you go and one is that you have this interesting, I know that you go a lot on feel, you, you, you talk about perception and feeling, but you also play a little bit with some measuring devices, heart rate variability. I know you've used, uh, you, 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 you've obviously been tested in the laboratory upon occasion, you know, the hemoglobin issues right now, I think you're playing a little bit with a shirt to measure. Yeah. Blood. Ventilation. Yeah. Thanks for, yeah, thanks for and, that. And it's, I'm, it's interesting. I'm interested in that as well. So what's your what what technologies do you find useful and and how do you try to balance this issue of technology versus perception just you know feel yeah um i i think like uh it's important to get as much data you can because that's like understanding of your individualities and and, and you need i i think if you want to make a training plan if you want to improve something you need to know what you are working on. And, and first is like, it's not that you will say like, okay, uh, that's the prototype of a 10K runner and I need to do these sessions to be that. It's like, no, okay, who am I first? Like, uh, right. and, and for that, you need to know what are your, um, like uh, how is, is your ventilation? How is your lactate response? What are your lactate capacities? Because that can be very, very different. Uh, what are you, what's your metabolism, like uh, fat or, or glycogen, where it switches, how it switches, and what's your uh, adaptation to 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 a different acclimatizations of terrain? What is your your uh, running economy? Do you have a difference between your right leg and your left leg or with your um, your her response and like your uh, uh, your recovery and, and, and all that? And, and if you more you understand yourself more you will be able to say okay this i can work this i don't need to work or this mm. if i work it will not make a difference and then start to working for that but for that you need to have all the data no and then it's like i try to do that um every now and then like uh one time every month or every second month to have some kind of um uh uh loops that i i do um uh recurrently and where i can i can measure myself and that can be mm. like uh from the basic keep uh kit I, I bring is like a uh, lactate uh the the glycogen uh some like about uh, uh the 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 substrate like a bit more like if it's fat or if it's uh or if it's um uh, glucose metabolism then uh the the heart rate is uh like uh the heart rate variability uh now also uh trying with the, the ventilation to see that 
um, uh, You've used saturation. Also mu muscle oxygen or, or yeah. blood oxygenation. The, yeah, yeah. I, I has the the nerves, so like uh, to mm -hmm. to measure like in in the two legs. That I know that I have a problem between one leg and the other because an accident I did in two thousand six. So not only on the on the muscle capacity, but my blood saturation in the muscle is different from one leg to the other. Since then, mm -hmm. um, and and then like the 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 saturation in the in the finger. So try to understand all these, and that I do test like every, yeah. Two months or so in the winter, no, because it's more like ordinary aerobic. But closer it gets to the season, I do some tests and, and see, okay, I I see, I picture myself how it is now. And then then I try to see what I, I want to improve. But then when it goes to the daily training, it's um uh, it's more like okay, what I want to train today, if it's uh if it's metabolism, it's like tempo, if it's that, and then like we have all these tools to measure things, but but we cannot measure everything that happens in our body. And especially like, I, I think that it's it's so complex that if we are measuring one um, one data only, it, mm. it will, it can be that this, uh, and, and especially in training or in races, that it can be that if you are not having a, if you are having a bad day on like I don't know heat acclimatization, then maybe you will work more the metabolism because it's it's uh, it's adapting to that, or uh, it can be the opposite in another day, and it can be. So then this data will be just uh, uh, noise because it will yeah. be saying something that is confusing. like not, yeah. it, it will be so confusing. Yeah. So then it's like I know what I want to feel at that training. I know that I want to feel. Um, I don't know, for example, like in a in a in a long training, I want to go to um to the feeling of uh of a race. Like uh, I know that in the race at kilometer 40, where the race uh where everything will happen, where I need to 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 be good, I will feel like that because the muscles, because the 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 lactate, because the the the, the all the ventilator, it will be that way. And I go training. And, and and then like I want to to achieve this feeling, right. and then do the workout. So that's uh, that's something that I I also been working this um, this year a lot with a, a Spanish physiologist uh, uh, Jesus Alvarez terms, and he's been like really focusing on that too. And it's something that I did naturally since I decided to self coach myself because I didn't. It was like no, I I don't want to train that way. I want to train that way. This is what's worth for working for me, and it was that to to really train on the feeling but not on okay i feel good i go faster okay i feel shit i go slower but say okay what uh, what do i want to feel today right and, and go to feel that and, and that uh, yeah i think it's uh it maybe takes more into account everything for the training and then during this test i can like kind of adjust if i'm doing yeah. good or, or not and, that, and that's what you wrote about also, as you said, you have to know who you are as an athlete. What are your strengths and your weaknesses? So you, you've used some technologies to, to understand your mm -hmm. physiology uh, quite well. But then when you go out into the training environment and the racing environment, you, you depend a lot on this, you know, you, your perception, you, you, your feel based on 20 years of of training and so it's it's kind of that interest it's an interesting mix that you've achieved you know you do an r d period occasionally <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> where you go in you play with the toys and you look at different things and and then but then you don't let them um drive yourself or yeah it's, right you don't let them take control of you uh you control your training and you because your 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 mind is where the decisions are being made the perception is happening so i i found that to be quite you know, uh, an interesting and nice, uh, balance that you have, you know, because you, you, you seem to be able to do both to be geeky and, and <laughs> test lots of things, but at the same time, be kind of in the flow and really just depending on feel at the same time. And so I think that's a, a nice, um, goal to have for a lot of people is find, find your technologies, do a little experimentation to understand how your body works, but then, trust your own mind when you're in the heat and i mean in the heat of the battle mm -hmm. and so i think that's a wonderful thing and the last thing i want to ask you because i know you, you you i'm sure you've trained and you're tired uh so i'm going to let you go but the last thing i want to ask you, you you've been 
you all the accolades are there. You've done everything you can do in your sport. The, the, but now in 2026, ski mountaineering will be an Olympic event. And I, I read what you wrote in Facebook when you became aware of this and what was it around July 21? Mm. Um, it reminded me of kind of a lot of maybe uh, a, a snowboard athlete named Daniel Franck back in 98 Olympics which, you know, yeah, it's a great honor to be in the Olympics, but I'm afraid that this, my sport is going to be changed by the, you know, becoming an Olympic event, that it won't be the same. So what's, where are you there? Uh, you know, I guess I want to ask, are you going to be walking into the arena for Spain as a, as a ski mountaineer athlete? Um, no, like uh, I, 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 I I think it's uh, I'm seeing how it's been evolving like I think Olympics it, it has this uh, ideal of like uh, uh, sports and it's like this dream like I think when you are a kid like you are like dreaming about like if you are in sports like oh the, the gold medal or or, or these like uh, but I have been seeing um how yeah to own to have the the dream and this uh, drive to get into the Olympics for sports, how it has changed the sport itself and how it has deformed it. And I think either it's a sport that it has um, a big um, background and a, and a big strength that uh, the Olympics will not matter. Like uh, I take, like, for example, road cycling. Right. It's yeah. in the Olympics, but and then who cares? Right. Like it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, Tour de France is uh, the classics. It's all that what matters, right. and then it's in the Olympics. So if in the Olympics they do an experiment, nobody cares. But sports that they are they have not this uh, this power, uh, and they are like changing them a lot to 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 fit into the Olympics because they they change the format. Um, it's uh, it's changing a lot how the sport is, mm. how it's perceived, but also like what's the this uh, the, the essence of the sport. And we have been seeing a thing with mountain biking, which at the beginning was more like a, a, a to B point, like a, a course, like technical discovering, and it was like uh, in the in the eighties, um, nineties, it was like thousands of participants in the races. And when they change to the Olympic format, where it's like doing loops Luke, and like people yeah. that it's uh, getting caught, they go out. Uh, so people were saying, okay, why should I go to a race if uh, in the second loop they will call me? So so it ended up that it's only a sport like for the elites. So it's one thing is mountain bike for like World Cup and Olympics. And the other thing is mountain bike for everybody that is going right. to the mountains and ride. But it's it's a disconnection between the two sports. It's It's two different things. Right. And and the, the the amateurs they don't care about what's going on in the in the World Cup or in the Olympics because it's not what they are practicing, and I think that's um, that's uh, happening with ski mountaineering. Like ski mountaineering, it's uh, like it's going to the mountains with the skis. Yeah. Uh, it's climbing summits, going down summits, off piste, and, and that. And the 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 race that is in the Olympics is like a three minute race on slopes completely artificial it's like i don't know any single person in the world that will say that is amateur that will say okay today we'll go for a ski tour for doing like a night tip a top uh, in the mountains and i will say okay i just go to the parking i do one minute full like full gas and go back to the car and go home like, <laughs> that's not real and, and yeah. i think this, this connection with the sport uh, already now is happening the world cup it's it's having a, a big separation with amateur practice. Uh, races are decreasing the number of participants. So of course, I think some countries uh, that they are not big on ski mountaineering, they will have people that it's uh, they will have more money, they will have more resources, and it will be probably uh, more people practicing uh, or not more people, more uh, countries on the on the international competitions. But all the popular competitions, they are decreasing the number of participants because it's disconnecting from, from what it, the sport is. And yeah, I think it's, uh, it's just because the sport 
was saying we want to grow, we want to go to the Olympics, not we want to grow as a sport. Right. Seeing for trail running on a way like it's a bit different way that it's like mm, big races are more important than what's a world championship. Right. So um it's a bit like cycling that uh, nobody yeah. cares. So we just like a uh, something yeah, you that have happens. a calendar of events yeah. that are that are bigger almost than the Olympics. Than the Olympics. Stuff, right. Well, that's a really interesting perspective you have. And it also is something I've seen is that television has television drives sport, at least at the at that higher level, because that's where the money is. And, and the Olympics absolutely have mm -hmm. uh, prostituted themselves to the television. Yeah. Company. Yeah. And, you need and, to have uh, this uh, visibility yeah. and, and, and to. Yeah. And, and races you can take triathlon you can take you know uh, road cycling they're all being governed by the the desire to create a viewer friendly course yeah. you know so triathlon for example where the cycling used to be pretty much a time trial steady yeah. now if i look at the power profiles for those events yeah. oh, really? oh they're just like this because of all the 90 degree turns in the course short hills viewer friendly exciting <laughs> but it's a different physiology it's a yeah. different race than it was originally so so yeah. this is interesting and 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 it and i'm sad that you won't be in the olympics representing spain but i understand i get it uh, yeah and no, i think at, at the end of the day is like why do you practice a sport no and it's like uh, Personally, I do because I want to be in the mountain. So it's an excuse. Yeah. It's like it's not. I think it's it's competition. It's fun. Like it's I'm super competitive. Yeah. But but it's not the main goal. And and I think that's like uh, it's it's pleasure most of it. So like then it's like I don't want to to compromise to even one single year of my life to train for uh, something that I know that I will not enjoy it. Right. Even if I can win, like I will not enjoy it. It's just like I just want to 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 do things that that uh, I love it and 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 for me like running or skiing or going in the mountains, it's it's a pleasure before all. Yeah. So it's uh yeah. Once again, you you said what I just hear from whether it's the great cyclist or a great speed skater or what is they say look it better be fun or I'm not going to keep yeah. doing it you know and that, <laughs> that, it fun is still fundamental to your success so i appreciate that you also uh, have reminded the people who will yeah. hear you that if it's not fun then we got a problem uh, yeah you know it's like people when they ask like where do you find motivation for doing that it's like uh, that i cannot answer this question like how how can i yeah like it's like where do you find motivation like it's if you don't have the motivation to to go out every day yeah. then probably you are doing the wrong thing like don't don't, don't hit the rock anymore like go do yeah. another thing you like would it's, you yeah. would be running in the mountains if there were no competitions i think that's fair to say right yeah no it's like yeah if, and i think all the sports like people that uh, are able to keep around the sport uh, at high level too because it demands a lot of energy a lot of uh, efforts for a long time they they first motivation it's it's pleasure it's that they yeah. love it because yeah. if not i believe that you can do like one two three years like on that hell of hard training <laughs> but if you don't love it yeah. if, if you need to find motivation to do it then like uh, impossible to keep longer yeah well, with that, I am going to say thank you so much for this wonderful chat. I know we could talk about a lot of things, but uh, I also know that I have grown kids and I can sit here and nobody cares, but you do, you have <laughs> kids and a, and a partner, so I'm going to let you go. So, and, and thank you so much for your time. No, thank you, Stephen. So uh, we'll have to talk about breathing and ventilation and all that another yeah, time. Yeah, another time. Yeah. Okay. Take care. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye.